are you? <laughs> Told him who he was. We pick it up at chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, who was Saul's son, became one in spirit with David. He loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Verse 5, whenever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. As I said last night, the Old Testament's very odd in some of their timeline stuff that from our way of writing that verse is totally out of place. <laughs> That should be several verses down. Because then we go to verse 6. It says, when the men were returning home after David killed the Philistine. So they just stuck verse 5 in. But that really shouldn't be there yet. Okay? He gave David all this stuff. And then when the men were returning home after David killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they said, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. They're singing this song. When now Saul hears this, he gets very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Well, the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Now, wait a minute. He's prophesying while being filled with envy and rage. Well, how is that possible? Well, the truth is, it is possible. You know, there's this great dichotomy in the spiritual world, particularly in the Christian experience. You know, every man, woman is born into the world Stillborn, We are like God. We're made in the image of God. God is the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are also like God in that there are three parts of us that make the one. Body, soul, and spirit. Just like God. It's three different things, yet it's still just me. Well, when sin came into the world, the spiritual part of man dies. And now every person who is born into the world is born spiritually stillborn. That's why everybody everywhere throughout the world from the beginning of Adam is born into the world and can tell something is wrong. Something is not quite right. Everybody senses it. Everybody feels it. It doesn't take long. And that's why people are doing all kinds of things desperately trying to fix what's wrong. Something's not right. What's, what's missing? And people turn, you know, they'll come up with uh, different religions in their attempt to connect with God. Others will figure, you know, gee, if I just have enough money, that'll fix what's wrong. But it can't fix it. Some people think, well, you know, if I just drink enough booze or score enough drugs, that'll fix it. But it doesn't fix it. Some say, boy, if I can just fight the right woman, <laughs> that ain't going to fix Jack. And everybody's running around doing everything they possibly can, trying to fix this thing. Well, when we come to Christ, we are now born again, the Bible says. Uh, Jesus taught us. And what it means is that spiritual part of you, all of a sudden, it now comes to life. What was still born is now born. And now you feel complete. You can sense it. For some people, it's rather dramatic. Some, it's not all that dramatic. It doesn't matter. It just depends on where you're at. But everybody, when you come to Christ, you, you sense the difference. Something's happened in me. The grass seems a little greener. The sky is a little bluer. Life is a wonderful thing because now I've been born again. And, and the world thinks we're crazy. You know? Why do y'all sing and dance? Well, because we've been born again. It feels good. Why do you serve in church? Why do you go to church? Because we've been born again. Why do you give money? Y'all crazy giving money. Because we've been born again. Feels good. Now here's the crazy thing. You would think now that we have been born again, the flesh has been put away. Oh Lord. 
were that the case. But the flesh is still there. Now, I know through baptism we're putting away the old man and stuff, but <laughs> and buried. But it's like these, you know, you ever go one of these, <laughs> you probably shouldn't, but <laughs> one, of the, one of these weird, you know, slasher movies, you know. You know, when a bad guy gets killed, but he keeps coming back. It's like, what is that? That a, freaks me out. I, I accidentally, I don't know how it happened. My wife and I, we went to some movie, uh, matinee, and I don't know what the time, I, I know what you did last summer, something like that. I didn't know what it was. And it's a, it's a slasher teen movie. And through the whole thing, I'm screaming like a teenage girl. Like, ah! ah! In fact, teenage girls were going, what's his problem? You know, I, it was bad. And, and I, you know, my wife, she hit me, I was, he's supposed to be dead, how's he back alive? You know, just, well, that's what it's like when you get saved. See, when you're first saved, you think, this is it. We have crushed the flesh. We are free, we're set free from the flesh. But it doesn't take long until, <laughs> that thing comes back up. <laughs> it's like, ah, what is that? And you can be born again and still struggle with the flesh. You can be serving God and running to somebody that just irritates the snot out of you. He's, oh, Jesus, help me not to hit him. <laughs> Man, I, I have been in the... This is just me. I know y'all are much more spiritual than me. Yes. Amen. You're Canadians, you know. <laughs> but I got to admit, I've been worshiping God and some pretty lady walks by and my mind goes, holy cow, look at... Whoa, man, what's that? I just, you know... Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. <laughs> like, how is that even possible? Spirit in the flesh still just, here's Saul prophesying, and he's full of hate. Dear God, help us all. That's why, as Christians, we need to have some discipline. Paul writes about this in Romans, the eighth chapter, verse five. Those who live according to the flesh, talking about Christians, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. See, if you're not careful, if you're not aware that you, you keep thinking flesh, it'll choke the life, spiritual life out of you. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. But see, before that, so the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That's where we want to live. The pathway that controls this is your thinking. A lot of us suffer, suffer from stinking thinking. But you will, I'm telling you, just when you, when you think you stand, boom, there it is. <laughs> just when you think, man, I got this handled, somebody will bring out the nasty in you. <laughs> right? Talk about more, more about that in just a minute. Help us, Jesus. All right, so he says, the next day, an evil spirit from God comes forcefully on Saul. Saul, I don't know what that means, but that's what happens. And he's prophesying in his house while David is playing the liar, as they usually did. And Saul had a spear in his hand. And he hurls it at him, saying to himself, I'll pin him to the wall. But the Bible says David eluded him twice. Twice? You throw a spear at me, that's your first and only shot. <laughs> there ain't no twice. I'm moving on, you know what I'm saying? Twice, he tries to kill you. You know, sometimes you're not sure if somebody doesn't like you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Well, man, I, I don't know if that guy likes me or not. I, I don't know if the pastor likes me. I don't know. So-and-so like But when somebody's hurling a spear at you, that pretty much settles it. They don't like you. Twice. Mercy. Saul was afraid of David. Really? <laughs> I'd be afraid of Saul. It was Saul that was most fearful because the Lord was with David and had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. That's where verse 5 should really be, where it says, and whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful, he gave him a high rank in the army. Again, some of these verses jump around. Like, anyway, so that's what happens. Everything did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David. Because he led them in their campaigns. So Saul says to David, Here is my older daughter Merab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of, of, of the Lord. 
for Saul said to himself, I won't raise a hand him. I'll let the Philistines do that. <laughs> so now remember, when David was hearing about this deal, he thought, hey, we get all the money and you get the chick. Yeah. Remember I told you, that probably wasn't true because he don't got the chick yet. Yeah. And we find out later, David says, I'm poor. So apparently the money was not a quite true story either. He was motivated by both, praise the Lord, but uh, wasn't the fact. So now he's getting around to offering his daughter. But David, who's very humble, says to Saul, who am I? And what is my family or my clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So he refuses. So when the time came for Merib, uh, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, well, she was given in marriage to Adriel instead. So it's like, well, David doesn't want him. Who else wants her? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you get her. You know, that was very romantic stuff. Very <laughs> Real chick flick in that story. Well, now we got chick number two. So now Saul's daughter, Michael, was in love with David. <laughs> All right. Because David's the butt kicker. He's out there. He's big time. He's this young general. We don't know how old he is. Again, the time frames we are getting very compressed when you read the Bible. It's, sometimes it takes you three minutes to read something. You've just covered 15 years of time. You know, you're not quite sure. But I don't know how long they've been at this. But now... But he's still young. Even if it's been three years, he's just now hitting 18. And he's this high-ranking guy and having all this incredible success. So Michael is just in love with him. And he's a pretty boy. <laughs> Remember, that's, what, that's why Saul hated him when he first saw him. This young punk, he's a good-looking little snot. <laughs> so Michael just, ha, 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 ha. So when Saul heard that Michael had the hots for David, this, was ple this pleased him. I said, well, I'll give her to him. He thought, so that she may be a snare against him so that the hand of the Philistines may come against him. So Saul said to David, now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. And then Saul ordered his attendants, guys, come here. Talk to David. And tell him, look, the king likes you. His attendants all love you. Be become his son-in-law. So they repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it's a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man. So apparently, there wasn't a big reward, and little known. Well, he was quite the rock star, to tell you the truth, at this point, but he's very humble. <laughs> then Saul's servants told him what David had said. So, oh, man, this kid is dumb as a brick. <laughs> How am I going get, to get him where I want him? So Saul replied, listen, listen, tell David, look, all the king wants for the price for his bride is just 100 Philistine foreskins. Oh. So, you know how some Native American tribes, when they would go to battle, they would scalp their enemies. <laughs> well, apparently, the Israelites would cut off the end of your wiener. <laughs> now, I don't know. If I was dead, I guess I wouldn't care. But if I got to say, dude, don't cut off my wiener. I'm already dead. You won. Leave the, leave the wiener alone. <laughs> it's in the Bible, man. I ain't making this up. <laughs> so I want 100 Philistine foreskins to take revenge on my enemies. See, Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Now, here's the thing. He wants 100 foreskins. It's not like these people just handed them over. Just a minute. Luke. There you go. No. no. That's not the way it works. You want my wiener, you got to kill me to get my wiener. So that's what, what he's saying. You got to go kill 100 guys. Well, it ain't easy to kill 100 dudes. So this is awesome. David would go, this is the Philistines will kill him. So the attendants told David these things, and David was pleased. <laughs> he thought, yeah, I'm a wiener taker, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, it's your Bible, I'm just telling you what it says. <laughs> so David took his men with him, and he went out, and he killed 200. 
and brought back their foreskins. And they counted out. <laughs> 20, 27. 20, 20. Was that 27? How, what number was that? 20. 20 I got to start over again, man. One, two, three. I don't know who had this job. Larry, you're up. I ain't going, man. I counted them last time. I don't want to touch them things. Larry, go. Man. So some poor sap counts out the full number. So that David might become the son. And then Saul gave him his daughter, Michael, in marriage. Well, there's a romantic story. I gave 200 wieners for you, baby. I love you, man. <laughs> Don't forget, I love you. Don't forget, who loves you, baby? 200. That's what I paid. That's right there. Good Lord. Verse 28, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter, Michael, loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and remained his enemy the rest of his days. Now, the Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. So now Saul sets out to kill David. We pick it up in 1 Samuel, the 20th chapter, and David fled, and he went to Jonathan and said, Jonathan's remember Saul's son, he said, what did I do? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Jonathan said, no, man, you're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. Well, it turns out to be so. And David starts running for his life. Samuel, 1 Samuel 23rd, chapter verse 14. David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert. Day after day, Saul searched for him. But God did not give David into his hands. Now, if you ever get a chance, you know, when, when you read like Samuel and, and Kings, uh, you know, they have these chronological Bibles that you can buy where it puts everything in order. The Bible is not in order. Who decided this? I have no idea. Why would this book come after this book? I mean, it's all jacked up. It's all, you try and just read the Bible straight through. Every time, it won't make any sense. What are they talking about? Even the New Testament, it's the same way. It's just in all different order. Who decided this? I don't know. It's actually fun. It's a lot easier if you take a chronological Bible and read it in the order, particularly in the New Testament. Boy, it starts making a whole lot more sense. You can start to understand when these things were written. Even during the book of Acts, a lot of the New Testament was written while Paul was still in the book of Acts. And in a chronological Bible, it'll stop like at Acts chapter 17 and then give you like Galatians or something, whatever it is. And you start going, oh, oh, okay, now I see the context. It starts making a lot more sense. Well, if, if you read this part of the scripture, grab a chronological Bible, because it's kind of fun, because as David is writing, that's when you start reading a lot of these Psalms. That when he's crying out to the Lord, oh Lord, deliver me. From my enemy, my, my tongue is parched. I, I mean, he's crying out to God. He's running for his life. Yeah. See, you just read this part. Well, day after day, Saul searched for him. No, no, no big deal. No, you read David's thoughts when he's going through. This is a big deal. This is really hard for him. He loved Saul. He didn't understand what was going on. He was very small in his own opinion. He just really didn't quite get it. Uh, his life was miserable. Miserable. This is 4,000 years ago. Few are the comforts of life 4,000 years ago, much less when you're running for your life. It's a bad situation. So that's where you get some of those incredible psalms as he's crying out to God. Well, in chapter 24, we get this interesting scenario. Uh, verse 3, he says, he, talking about Saul, because he's out there looking for David, trying to kill him. Well, he, he came to the sheep's pen along the way, and there was a cave there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. The NIV, you know, just, he, he goes in to take a poop. That's really what's happening here. <laughs> so how do you know that? For several reasons. Number one, the nice thing about being a man is if you got to take a leak, you just leak. <laughs> you just whip it out, and there you go. It's not a big deal. Nobody makes it a big deal. You're out hunting, fishing, and stuff. Your buddy's right there. You just whip it out. <laughs> 
Dude, point that way. But when you got to poop, you try to find a little privacy. Because there is one immutable fact of life. Nobody looks cool when they poop. They don't. Just, there is no cool factor at all. You know, it's one thing you go into a men's room and there's, you know, there's urinals there. There's no wall between anything. You just do your thing. But when it comes to pooping, I hate it when you go to places and there's no doors on the poopers. Right? You walk by like, oh, dude, man. It's like... And, and the other is because what happens now takes some time. Hence the pooping scenario. <laughs> so Paul, Saul, Paul, Saul goes in to take a poop. He's got his cave. Now the irony of this, now remember, there is this cat and mouse game going on constantly. At times they got incredibly close. Paul, Saul is, or David is running from Saul, but at times they get really close and they're all like, here he is, you know, they're hiding. So, well, so happens, Saul's getting close and David's men are there. So they go hide in this cave. And then here comes Saul to poop in the cave. And I'm thinking, dude, don't poop in our cave. <laughs> it's a small cave. It's a, come on, man. So when he's there, and, and all of a sudden David's man says, Oh, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed because the man's doing his thing. He's reading the paper, you know, not paying attention. David creeps up and he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe, slides back. And then David, afterwards, conscious, he felt horrible for doing it. Really? He felt horrible for doing it. He said to his men, Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to lay my hand on it, for he's the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men. Now, he probably didn't do it very loudly because they're still hiding in the cave. Why'd you do that? Don't be great to that. <laughs> and then it says, and then Saul left the cave. So all this happens when he's still there meditating. <laughs> so David, Saul gets far enough away. There's enough space now. Because apparently Saul really went out of his way. He wanted his private time because nobody looks cool. He gets far enough, David, and in verse 8 says, David went out of the cave and he called out to Saul, My Lord, the king! And Saul looked behind him. There's David. He bows down and prostrates himself with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, well, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I didn't lay a hand. So he makes his whole appeal. He says, look, I had the chance to kill you. You were right there. And I didn't do it. Why are you coming after me? Man. Now compare that with what we talked about last night. About the accusers. Wanting to find fault. Picking it. Pointing at men of God. Pointing out, I don't like the way he does this. I don't like the way he does that. And some churches, you know, they just egg on this stupidity. Now, I understand that your churches are pastor-run. Is that right? Pastor-led? Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Yes. Serious. Yes, I wouldn't do it any other way. Come on. I'd, I'd rather work at Walmart. Yeah. Now, I have to be mean, but I don't understand congregationally run churches. That's like the inmates running the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> and that culture creates this attitude of disrespect. Yeah. Come on. Where? Well. I'm the boss. You're just the pastor. We'll vote you out. And these guys, these, you know these pastors, if you talk to them, it's a horrible life they have. They, they live in fear all the time. So well, they shouldn't be afraid. Hey, you spend all your life preparing for a job and your family depends on this job and all it takes is two or three psychos to get everybody in a lather and they'll vote you out. Now what you going to do? It's terrifying to them. It's why a lot of Men of God in the pubs are so weak today. They, they can't touch any subject that might offend anybody. They wouldn't be talking about pooping, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you can't fire me, so I don't care. <laughs> but David, what respect. And I got to tell you, 
I don't understand this. This, this is, I mean, I'm all for teaching, treating guys with respect, but me, I don't stab the man <laughs> and apologize later. <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Sorry, Lord. Man, this guy is trying to kill you. Your life is a living hell. Read some of those Psalms. Here he is right there. He doesn't know. He picked the one cave all y'all are hiding in. It would have been nothing for them to take him out and it had all been over. It all had been done. It had been finished. It would have been wrapped. But he doesn't touch him. Well, actually, he touches the edge of his garment and he is guilt stricken for doing it. Now, I, I don't understand it. I mean, that's just, that's way beyond anything I can begin to understand. But one thing's for sure, we don't have no idea what it means to respect the office of pastor, the office of the man of God. I mean, even in our situation where I think we do better than most, wow, how about that, huh? Well, most of us don't have anybody trying to kill us. But we all run into people that give us a hard time. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to give you a mini message called How to Deal with the Jerk. <laughs> so this is how it works. Now, you get saved, and Christianity is different than any other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world, you have to study, prepare, learn, go through the rituals and everything before you can even become a whatever it is that you want to become in a desperate attempt to, to, to touch God. And they never can because you can't do it that way. Think about, about Christianity. Christianity starts exactly the opposite. You begin by touching God. You're born again. You encounter the living Christ. And you don't know Jack. You're dumb as a brick. You don't know nothing. How many of you got, you got saved? You didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. The guy who led me to the Lord didn't know nothing. I'm not kidding. I remember he was telling, you know, the Bible says this and about, after I got saved for a couple of months, I thought, man, he's full of it. That Bible don't say none of that. <laughs> he didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. Do you see how different that is? You want to become a Jew, you got to study to become a Jew. You want to become a Muslim, you got to study to become a Muslim. You got to learn all, you got to go through all the rituals, whatever religion, Buddhist, Hindu, you got to learn, you got to study, you got to indulge, you know, learn as much as you can, do the practices, da, 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 and then eventually you, know, you can become a whatever, and hopefully you can now touch God. Of course, you never can. Christianity is exactly the opposite. We start out, boom, we encounter God, and you don't know nothing. Right. Ephesians 2, verse 8. We know these verses, right? For it's by grace that you've been saved. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. You don't earn it. That's why it happens. Otherwise, you think, well, I earned this touch with God because I studied. No. It's, you don't know anything. It's not about you. It's about him. But after we've been saved, not now we have to grow. You see what I'm saying? Now that we've been born again, born again, now that we've encountered the living Christ, now we have to grow. In Philippians 2, verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, if you have always obeyed, not only my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, we're not trying to work to get saved, but we're going to work it out after we got saved. It's kind of confusing. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's just not instant. You got to work this thing out. Why? Because you don't know nothing. You got to grow. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. Big fancy religious word there. Just means clean you up. May God, the God of peace, clean you up through and through. Why? Because you, you kind of stink. <laughs> How many of you know sometimes we just stink? We just, sometimes I, I, you know, it's one thing when you smell. It's another thing when you can't stand your own smell. You know what I'm saying? It's been a while, so whatever reason, you haven't used deodorant for a couple of days, you're out camping or something. Or something. What is that? Oh, Lord, it's me. That's, that's horrible. You know, you're sitting before the Lord and pretty soon you start going, oh man, it's me. I got issues. How many of y'all got issues? A few of you got issues, you sinners. Good thing I came. 
straighten them all out. <laughs> Men of faith with issues, what a shock. May God sanctify you, clean you up. Wait a minute, I've been born again. I know, but you got issues. May your whole spirit, body, and soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Look, don't get discouraged. The things need to be cleaned up sometimes in your life. The reality is some things always need to be cleaned. Now, the women in our lives, you know, women get mad because they do most of the cleaning. Well, we can do the cleaning. It's just we don't care. <laughs> I mean, seriously, a lot of guys could live like hamsters. Wad up some paper, sleep there, poop there. He's good. You know what I'm saying? But, but they're not hamsters. Oh, this guy talks a lot about pooping. I don't know what this is about. But, but women, they, don't, they always clean the things. And they get mad because it's got to clean again. The Bible says, where there is no ox, the stall is clean. <laughs> Bunch of oxes? What's the matter with you? But great strength comes by the ox. Praise the Lord. They get mad because they got to clean stuff. They got to clean stuff. And I always tell the women, listen, y'all need to relax. The truth is, even if your husband and kids weren't there, things still need to be cleaned. Do you know that? Do you know you can clean a house from top to bottom, get everything spay, lock the doors, and it's still going to get dirty? It will. How is that possible? Isn't it crazy? It's like we live in this fallen world and everything is always in a state of decay. You come back long enough, there's dust everywhere. No, he's been in there, there's dust everywhere, there's bugs. Creepy, how do they get in? Spider webs, you got to clean it up. No one's even been in there. Something's always got to be clean. Everything got it. It's just, it is what it is. You know, you know, some of you got your guys, you know, you got cars and stuff. You know, one of the worst things you do for an engine is not run it. Yeah, you would think best things I'll get an engine. I'll never run it. Yeah. No, that's bad because it'll decay. You need to run it. Then after you run it, you got to clean it up and change oil. It's like it never ends. I'm a pilot. I used to have my own airplane. Last time I came to Regina, I think I flew myself in here, which is a lot faster than taking commercial flights. Man, that took me forever to get here. They flew me to Detroit, which is the other way, and then to Toronto, which is even further the other way. <laughs> then they flew me to Regina, because y'all don't have commercial flights here, and we got to drive for an hour to get here. It was a long day, man, I'm telling you. Good night. I had an airplane, a Piper Meridian, turboprop, jet engine, 28,000 feet, 300 miles per hour. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've been flying for over 20 years. Pre oh, yeah, pressurized. Oh, yeah, your brains will pop at 28,000 feet. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it won't pop, but you have a hard time breathing. You won't be able to breathe. Anyway, I had to sell it because got so stinking expensive <laughs> but you know what's bad is, is you got to pay for the maintenance yeah. so you think well maybe I won't fly it so much but that's worse you got to light it up you can't just leave it sitting on the tarmac there were times and we were flying constantly but there were times everyone saw you a month or two you weren't flying you still had to get out to the airport pull it up light up the turbos let the thing go for a while and make a mess. Because the worst thing is to leave it. You got, it's just life. Don't get discouraged that the Spirit of God is constantly have to sanctify you. It is life. We live in a fallen world. We live around all kinds of messes and we just need to keep cleaning up. We're all called to grow spiritually, improve our faith. And God bless y'all for coming to this conference. You're the kind of man who said, you know, I need to go to this. I need a little cleaning, a little, little tweaking. You're out there serving God and you still got to clean it up. Yep. Bible challenges us to clean things up. Ephesians 4th chapter, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness. Why? Because you can get bitter. Get rid of all rage. Why? Because people tick you off. Anger, brawling, and slander. Along with every form of malice. And there's so many. <laughs> so many versions of this. We come up with new versions of nasty all the time. And be compassionate kind to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, we know that we're supposed to be walking in peace. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 
Since as members of one body you were called to peace, be thankful. We're supposed to walk in peace. Now here's what we do. We all manipulate our surroundings so that we can live in peace. There's nothing wrong with that. We all do that. I do that. Everybody does it. But we have to be careful not to fool ourselves into thinking the reason we have peace is because we have become so sanctified. The icky is all now gone. Hallelujah. <laughs> my life is good. Because, see, I got rid of all the jerks in my life. You get rid of all the people that irritate the snot out of you. Make, you don't want to hang on people that irritate you, right? So we kind of distance ourselves, and, but then we fool ourselves. Now we think, well, this is good. I have arrived. Bless the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about sex a little bit later. <laughs> Praise the Lord. One of the things about men, the thing that just drives us all crazy, the sexual drive, it's all driven from one chemical called testosterone. It flows through our blood, makes us crazy. I tell women all the time, say, if you had any idea how crazy this made us, you would be more disgusted with us than you are right now. <laughs> well, I had encountered some kind of, I didn't know what it was. I didn't even realize what happened, but it was messing with my testosterone levels. It started dropping like a rock. At first I thought, praise God, I have arrived. <laughs> I'm not tempted at all anymore. I mean, the hottest chick in the world over in front of me didn't bother me at all. She could have been buck naked. I would have said, hey, put some clothes on. Wouldn't have bothered me at all. I thought, praise God. I have matured in my faith. <laughs> but then I started getting all these physical ailments. Because when that starts happening, you start hurting in places you didn't know you had. And I just, ugh. Oh, what's wrong with me? This is nasty. So I went to the doctor. He says, your estrogen levels are high. <laughs> well, dang, I wasn't expecting to hear that. <laughs> because I had developed this condition. Some guys get it. It's where at some, and usually you hit 50s or 60s, some of you guys get it. Where your body literally starts turning your testosterone into estrogen. Why is that? I don't know. But I was fortunate to have this. <laughs> So my estrogen levels are coming, my testosterone levels drop. I'm in pain. Ooh, ah. So the good news is it's really easy to fix. Praise the Lord. So they fix it. My testosterone level shoots up again. Oh, no. I'm like, oh, Lord, look at that. Oh, Lord. oh, oh come on. Come on. You mean to tell me I ain't nearly as rich as I thought? All of it was just because of the chemical. Here I thought I had grown in the Lord. Oh my, and it's like that with these scenarios. We get peace in our lives because we work to get trouble out of it. And we get away. We set everything up and we deceive ourselves. Easy to do. James warns us about this. James 1 verse 22. We know this verse, right? Don't just listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. You got to do yourself. We deceive ourselves. It's easy to do. We think we're okay when we're just not okay. So what happens is we create this environment where everything is good until we encounter a jerk. And now the jerk upsets everything in us and we find ourselves acting rather nastily. And we think the problem is that jerk. The jerk is the problem because he is causing internal disruption in my soul. And like an affection, we must attack it. But here's the bad news. The jerk is not the cause of your bad behavior. The jerk is simply revealing that you haven't finished growing. Proverbs 24, 10. If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Now that's kind of a cruel verse. Because we think, you know, so many stumbles, it must cause life is hard. So I was, you fall, you're just the wuss. You're strange. In times of trouble, it just shows... If, 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 if you stumble, it just shows that you're weak. Ooh, ow. Many people believe that the trouble with the icky that keeps popping up is the result of their environment, other people. And the answer is to simply fix the environment. Get rid of those people. This is so true when it comes to where you work, the people you work with. If the people you work with constantly bring out the nasty in you, I got bad news. It ain't the people, it's you. Because there's not supposed to be any nasty in you. He shouldn't be able to bring up any nasty in you. I hear people all the time, you pass, oh, pass, I wish I could work for the church. 
I just like work around Christians all the time. My life would be good if I could just work around people of faith. And then every once in a while, you know, you hire somebody from your congregation because you need a position. And they come in and they're just starry-eyed. They come in, their eyes just glowing. This is the answer to their prayers. And after a few months, they're in hell. Because <laughs> apparently I am a jerk. Apparently, I'm not so pleasant to be around all the time. People say, Pastor, I love you. I, say, I know, because you don't know me. <laughs> the closer I, you get, the harder I am to love, apparently. And these people, we see these kids, they're all just totally discouraged, so disillusioned. I thought, I thought I was going to work around Christians, and things would be great. <laughs> That's your fault. You don't have to work it. Sometimes just volunteering in church. People think, well, this is going to be great. I'm going to run all these people of faith. We're going to love God. It's going to be faith. But then people start ticking you off. And then you hear them say, well, you're a Christian, a bunch of hypocrites. It doesn't going to work for the church. Look at all these terrible people. And the problem isn't the people, it's you. All of us. We need to be able to live out our life, even in a hostile environment. Jesus said, Matthew 5, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That you might be the children of your Father in heaven. It causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I wouldn't do that. I'd just send rain on the righteous people. All you unrighteous people can dry out. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's what I think. If I ran the sun, all the wicked people would walk in the dark. I'd give you no sun. <laughs> Half my congregation, I would give them sun because they don't come to church every Sunday. Y'all freeze. Come to church. I'll turn the light on for you. Amen, right? Amen. Just come to church. I'll give you a little heat. Come on. But that's not what he does. Our Father, he, he blesses the wicked and the just. He gives sun and rain to everybody. Oh, man. Jesus says, if you, if you love those who love you, what do you think and do? Who cares, he says. Who cares? The thing is, we surround ourselves with people who love us. I love you, man. I love you, too. Oh, man, I'm walking in love. No, you're not. You just got somebody that you like. You got rid of all the jerks you don't like. It doesn't make you spiritual. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Don't even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your own people, yo, bro, what's up? Well, he says, who cares? Even the pagans do that. You know, married people do this all the time. They're convinced their life is miserable because that wicked woman, if it wasn't for that woman, my life would be at peace. Because she brings out the worst in me. No, she don't. She shows you the worst in you. Come on, right? It's easy to fool everybody else because they don't see you leave your underwear all over the place. Right? They don't see you break wind under the covers. Oh, man, what is that? How do you deal with a jerk? You're supposed to love them. The reality is the jerks in your life are not your problem. We are our own problem. And if you get around certain people, and of course, by nature, we just try to get away from them. But it needs a little bit of a reality check. It's generally not the other person. It's just they're bringing out the ugly in you. And it's time to get back to prayer and cracking open the Bible and God help me be a better man. Clean me up. Clean, why? Because everything needs to get cleaned over and over again. It just is what it is. Life is hard. The good news, we die. <laughs> Seriously, you're running this point, you know, they don't know nothing about spiritual ass. Well, I think heaven's right here on earth. Sucks to be you, man. <laughs> this is your version of heaven. <laughs> Continuing on, we're now in 2 Samuel, chapter 6. And Saul finally is killed. He's dead. David becomes king. And David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 14, he says, wearing a linen ephod. He's, this is a lot these guys had. David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. 
while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, remember her, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing, and the guy's half naked, he's just boogieing down. And she despised him. Well, they brought the ark of the Lord, set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. It's a great day, great day of fellowship. Everybody's excited. Wonderful victory, this incredible event. After he had finished sacrificing burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And he gave everybody a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. It's a lot of cakes to every person in the crowd. The whole, that's a, seriously, where do you find that many cakes? And he gives it to everybody, both men and women. And all the people went home. It was a good day. We celebrated. We had a good time. We got a bunch of cakes and dates. When David returned home to bless his house, own household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked in full view of the slave girls and of his servants as any vulgar fellow would do. And David said to Michael, hey, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. <laughs> now we're getting to it, right? <laughs> or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the people, Lord's people Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. And I will become even more undignified than this. I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in great honor. And he was. It says, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Which means he didn't give her none anymore after that. I ain't laying with you. You irritate me. <laughs> now in all fairness, the guy had like six, seven wives. It's easy to do. Ignore one when you got six more in the wings. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's what happens. But the point of this is that here is a man that we've been reading about. An incredible, starts out as a young guy. All these incredible things, a wonderful attitude, respectful, even in the worst of situations. And he just had a free soul. He was free, man. He got out there. He's dancing. He's celebrating. Jesus said the truth. He'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. He said, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. We know this verse. Don't even need to put it up. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. We're free from what? We're free from our sins. We're free from failure, free from guilt, free from condemnation, free from what other people think about you. And I've never really cared much what other people think about me. That's why I talk the way I talk. It's a strength and a curse at the same time. But, I mean, it really is. Somebody gets really mad at me, I go, okay. Let's go get a sandwich. I mean, I don't care. I don't care. It just doesn't bother me. I know pastors get just devastated if they found somebody that doesn't like them. And everybody's just different. I'm just, there's something wrong with me. I don't, I don't know, you know. Sorry, this one pastor, he was devastated because this one couple had left the church. I'm listening to him and thinking back to some stuff he'd said to me earlier. He says, well, wasn't that couple the one that was giving you all the problems? Well, yeah. Well, shouldn't you be celebrating? <laughs> if I got a choice, stay and make me miserable or go on and be blessed, I'm sending you a card. Goodbye. See ya. But if there's one word that describes a victorious believer in Christ, it is this freedom. Yeah. Are you walking in freedom? Are we walking in this freedom? The thing is, we still get icky sticking to us. We kind of gum up. You got to work things out. You got to run the engine. But even when you run the engine, then you gum up and say, well, I shouldn't run the engine. No, it'll only make it worse. It's just life. Life is messy. It's just, it's just messy. Sometimes we, we just still got issues and we should expect to have issues. That's why Paul says when you take communion, examine yourself. As often as you do this. And they did it all the time. 
How often do you guys do communion? Typical once a month type thing? Yeah. But we do it every Sunday. Doesn't make us more spiritual. It's just we come. 80% of my church is ex Catholic. I like those Catholics. <laughs> I do. They're really sweet people. They come to church. A lot of them still cussing. It's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Somebody drop a bulletin. Oh, shit. They get, oh, man, don't. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I had this older guy. He's like 70. 70 oh, he's over 70 years. 75 years old. He just recently gets saved. He starts reading the Bible. Then he reads what we're going to read after the break about David falling into sin. He's all upset. In the foyer, out loud. There's people everywhere. He says, Pastor. What's with this son of a bitch, David? <laughs> I didn't say that. He said it. <laughs> you said son of a bitch. No, I didn't. He said it. What's with this son of a bitch, David? And I said, just keep reading. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> Try to calm him down. Quit cussing. <laughs> I like those Catholic Catholics. We do communion in your life. The whole point of communion is, man, don't forget. Don't forget what this is all about. His body was broken so we could be whole. His blood was shed so we could have forgiveness of sin. Jesus said, do this as often as you do it in. Why? Because we forget. We forget. How many times the Bible says, sometimes we forget we've been forgiven of our old sins. We forget who are you. He says, and before you do it, examine yourself. Why? Because we've got to clean up. Either we're gunked up because we haven't done something or we get gunked because we were doing something. <laughs> it's the engine. You can't win. The good news is you die. <laughs> so you got to constantly just reevaluate and check and where am I at? How many of you know we get free but we still got issues? One of my favorite accounts in the New Testament is when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I mean, now he'd raised other people from the dead, but they weren't dead all that long. They were probably just mostly dead. Yeah. You guys remember that movie? Princess Bride? One of the best movies of all time, man. It's just fabulous. He's not, that's what you think. He's just mostly dead. But these guys, they could have just been mostly dead. I mean, let's face it. Look, it is what it is. We struggle in our faith. If my brother here falls over unexpected, I mean, just drops dead, dead, cold, dead. And somebody comes over and just, he's dead. And I come over and I lay hands on him and all of a sudden, and he gets up. You know, some of you think, oh, he just probably had gas. <laughs> you know, that's what you think. You know, well, maybe raise it. Well, maybe, but come on. He was only mostly dead for 20 minutes, you know, 30 seconds. I mean, come on. The thing about Lazarus, he's officially dead. He is in the grave for days. Jesus comes and says, open up the grave. He went, oh, you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Lord, he reeks, man. This is, this is bad. Just, just open it up. Bob, you go do it. I ain't doing it, man. I'll, I'll throw up. I can't take it. <laughs> but why do I always got to do it? He's gonna, and they roll back, and everybody is watching like, what is he doing? It's one thing when he's still laying there because maybe he expired five minutes earlier. You know, who knows? You, you've got to realize when he rose people from the dead, a whole bunch of people probably thought, Bob, he probably wasn't really dead. Right? It's the way people think. Even our own churches have our congregation to think, you know, we probably wasn't really dead. He just had gas. <laughs> this guy, he's in there for days. Even if he wasn't dead when he went in. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead now. Man. You know, every once in a while, you, you read these stories about this guy, he's in a morgue, and all of a sudden he comes awake. Yeah. You ever see, read the stories? Oh, man, I would die for sure. If I'm in a morgue, and all of a sudden some guy gets up, what am I doing here? Oh, man. 
that would be it for me. So anyway, John chapter 11, verse 43. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. I mean, they're all wondering, what, what is he doing? He, he rolls away to stone. It's, oh, dude, what, what are we doing here? What's going on? Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now, you know, everybody went. <laughs> right? Oh, this I got to see. What do you mean come out? And the Bible says the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with linen, strips of linen and a cloth around his face. He looked like a mummy. I would have surely died. I was seriously, I'd have freaked. Some guy rolls back and says, come out of there. And this guy comes out. I'm like, that oh I'm, I'm serious I bet you people were hitting the floor just oh heart stopping and Jesus said to him take off the grave clothes let him go see that's kind of where a lot of us are at especially those if you're newly saved you come to life and it's great you're alive but still got issues <laughs> it's good to be alive but I still want to kill somebody. <laughs> I'm, I'm alive, praise the Lord, but my wife irritates me to no end. She doesn't stop talking. How can you say that many stuff over and over again? <laughs> I come, I'm tired. I'm, I'm born again, but the band is too loud. Y'all too loud. <laughs> I went to that men's conference he kept talking about pooping I don't understand what is that Just... we got issues how many of y'all got issues oh, yeah, yeah. yes yeah. we come to life but now we got to get free sometimes you need somebody to help get you free that's why we're doing what we're doing here yeah. trying to unwrap us trying to unravel us so we can get free take the grave clothes off hallelujah we're going to pause for a break. Yeah. Ten minutes? Is that the plan? Man of God?